today we have another hub talk and I'd like to welcome one of the top Latin um, female dancers of our generation, of our time, uh, Viata. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'd like to start by asking, um, where are you from originally? I'm originally from Lithuania. And um, how old were you when you started dancing? Actually, I was six years old. I started dancing because um, I saw my cousin dance and I liked how that looked and I wanted to do the same thing. And I remember very clearly that actually to come to that class, you had to be seven or older. So I lied to the teachers. I said I was already seven and that was my beginning. And that was your beginning. Yeah. And so did you start dancing um, both programs, standard Latin or? In those days, all the kids started with mats and ball, and we also did like a traditional dancing. So yes, we did all of it. We did all of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, you were very famous and successful. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the success that you had back in USSR before you came to United States? Well. Because I started so young, of course, we kind of won the juvenile, we won, you know, all the, we went one like by the age and one by one. So we did become, at that time, the USSR ballroom and Latin champions and the traditional dancing as well. So that was just a part of the process. Like we all did that and we, my, my, my dance partner was older than I was. So he was three years older. So I was dancing in a higher grade, like in an older age. But yes, we became champions and in all the three you know, the styles, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how old were you when you came to United States? We, my family and I, we immigrated in 93, so I was 15. And uh, at that time when we came here, uh, it was a very difficult time because my parents really wanted me to stay there because they knew that if I come here, probably my dancing would be over. And all my dance teachers and my dance partner and his parents, they all begged us, please keep her here because probably if she goes to the United States, she won't be dancing anymore. And for some reason, just in the last minute, my parents said, no, she has to come with us, which of course I was very upset with them. I, and uh, so when I came here, in the beginning, I was devastated because of course in 93, there was not many young kids dancing here. It was all, most of it was professional programs, but there were not many kids dancing. So I thought that's it, my dance career was over. But of course, as we talk about later, we will. Uh, so yeah, I came here in 93, which I, when I was 15. You came here when you were 15 years old. Did you start dancing right away or you had a break? What, what happened, what transpired? I did have a little break, but actually when I came here, my cousin who was already living here, the same cousin that I started dancing, she was already here for a couple of years before me. Uh, she was, she introduced me to Victor Konevsky, which I'm sure everybody knows. <laughs> yeah, so when she introduced me to him, uh, at that time, I knew that the only way I could find a partner, because there was nobody dancing my age, I, if I would do pram. So Victor and I, we actually did pram for a year. And that's how I found my next partner, Michael, because he saw us dancing at the USDC. Okay, so you were 16 years old. Michael at the time, if I remember, he was already a very established yes. dancer, very well known. How was it dancing? Yeah, you were an established dancer as well. But not but, the same. As but not the same as him. He was already in a more adult uh, mm -hmm. level, uh, world famous. How was it? Was it difficult? Was it? Talk us through it. Intimidating. <laughs> well, let me t tell you about the trials that we have. Uh, so, like I said, I was dancing Prem uh, in USDC and again, hoping that maybe somebody will see me. And after we finished dancing and we won, at that time, uh, Victor comes to me and he says, I have a partner for you. Okay. So here comes this guy that I, I, I did not know him because when he became famous, I was already in America, so I wasn't watching the tapes. I did not know who he was because he just became famous at the time when I was already here. And he goes, my name is Michael. I liked your dancing. Would you, would you be interested in having a tryout with me? I said, of course, of course. So then the next day he was competing which was amateur co competition and uh, i'm sure you know William and Amstel and julie Fly fryer they were the 
top couple. They were, I think they were the world champions at that time. And during that competition, Michael beats them. So I, so now I have to have a try the next day after, you know, when it was his uh, uh, Veronica Patrick. And at that time, actually, the reason they were, Michael was looking for a new partner because she was dating Donnie Burns at that time. <laughs> and she knew that she's going to stop dancing. So that's they were, cool they were so open okay. about that. So that's why he was looking for a new partner because he knew that that's one of the oh. last competitions. Um, so he wins Amateur title and the next day we have a tryout so of course already I'm shaking like a leaf just thinking about it so I come to the uh, practice place and who's sitting there Peter Maxwell John Timmons Donnie Burns Gaina <laughs> Veronica and the whole Everybody is there. So, of course, you can only imagine how that trial went. <laughs> so, I was, after that, I was like, there's no way we're going to dance together because I, like, I could barely stand on my feet. I was shaking like a leaf. But to my surprise, he said, I would like to dance with you. Okay. So, I think I remember that you, you were practicing in Brooklyn. You were, you were staying in New York. Mm -hmm. um, how was that first year, I guess, probably the most difficult year? Absolutely. I mean, of course, it's very difficult when you start dancing with somebody who's very established and everybody knows and you're kind of, you know, even though hip I was well known in my country, it's, it's a two different ages and everything. It definitely was not easy. And also, not just that, we were very different styles to begin with. If you can, if I'm not sure if you know Michael, of course, he was a very fast, very powerful dancer. He, he was known for his, you know, speed and power. And I was, when I started with him, completely the opposite. I was very slow. Because in, in Lithuania, my, I, I still to this day, I thank my beginning of my dancing started there because my teachers were amazing there. And the core that I got was definitely there. And the core was technique, the legs, you know, they, it was completely different from what Michael was. So of course, when we started dancing together, it was very difficult for me, especially because I just felt like I couldn't do anything. I couldn't match, because you always want to match your partner or at least, you know, be as close as possible to what the vision was. And it was completely different in the beginning, but uh, we both knew that uh, we both, he knew and I knew that I'm capable of, do that, of doing that and I knew that I just needed time and we both believed in us and I guess that with time things happened. <laughs> okay, so I think you became a world champion pretty fast in that process. Well, we started dancing in 94 and we became uh, world champions in 98. And you know, it was very diff interesting how it all happened because in the, the first year when we started dancing, we were still in America because I was still waiting for my green card. And the day I, again, very clear, remember when I got it, I got it on May 24th, which was, and mm -hmm. as I got it, we flew straight to Black Hole. So we were mm -hmm. just sitting on the edges, hoping that I, because we usually used to get letters that it's just it's coming soon, you're gonna get it. And the minute I got it, we went to Black Hole. That first Black Hole, we were in 24. And then in July, if I remember correctly, we moved to London. Uh, we had no money to take lessons. The only thing we did, we were just practicing in Semley, which was, I'm sure some of you know, the, the, the studio of those days. Uh, we were just there every single day and people saw us there. And just by being in the surroundings of everybody, when the next big competition, which was an international in October, we made the final. But we really had maybe one or two lessons if we, if that even so it's not like you know it's just being basically by being in mm -hmm. with everybody helps, in yeah. surroundings that energy, that's, that helps, yes yeah. yes you don't know why but just by watching correct us, you know. correct so that was our beginning mm -hmm. okay do you remember who was second when you won <laughs> <laughs> at the world yes it was matthew and nicole, matthew and nicole. yes okay. matthew cutler yes okay, I remember. Mm -hmm. okay. How many times did you become a world champion? The world champions we just became once because uh, what we did, uh, I don't know if you remember, but in those days, I feel like I've, those days it was so long ago, <laughs> it was long ago. Whenever amateurs used to win, like a major title, the next thing was when they turned professional, the, the, the 
thing was that you do a rising star, you win a rising star, and then you probably hopefully become a semi-final, and then you wait your turn to get into the final. When when we won the amateur that year, all the professionals split. Like most of the so the only people who stayed in the final thing was Yuka and Serpa, but Brian, Alan, Paul, everybody split. So what that happened, we thought, okay, we, everybody's starting black pools fresh, so maybe it's a good idea to go all in because nobody's set at the moment and see what happens because maybe we have a chance to. So that we were actually, I think, the first ones to do that because after us, every, all the amateurs, when they won, they won straight and it kind of made the final probably most of the time or were right next to it. So that's exactly what happened. We, our first competition was Blackpool. We never told anybody besides our coaches that we're turning pro. So when people opened the program, that was a surprise for them because they saw our ad. And I remember very clearly we went really all out for that ad because we represented South Africa. So we had the lions and like the whole <laughs> shebang. It was really, we tried to be creative. And that year we became finalists when we were six. So I guess it works. Who was your inspiration when you were dancing? You know, um, in those days, especially when we were young, we only used to watch tapes because, of course, we never used to come and watch the see competitions. So I never had one particular person. I just liked, like, I liked everybody and just kind of looked from everybody to take something. So I could never say that I was only had that one person I tried to copy. That wasn't the case. I just liked the style of dancing. And I think also another thing why we kind of maybe did not look like everybody else because we we danced what we felt like and we had our unique style just because we never followed one particular person. So I mean, everybody in those days in the final were great and you, you just kind of picked you know, a few things that you thought that suited you. So I cannot say that one particular person was you know, the inspiration. All of them were great. And what about your teachers? Who would you say um, made the biggest impact on your dance careers? Um, we never had too many teachers because in the beginning, especially as amateurs, we couldn't afford any lessons. We Because in those days when we, in order to kind of be successful, we had to be living in England or in, in that area. It's not the same these days, but in order to do, make that sacrifice, we like I never had any papers to work there, so I couldn't really earn money. Michael was a little bit more lucky because his grandmom was, uh, she had a British ancestry, so he could get a visa to actually work there. But again, we devoted all our most of our time to dancing. So the, the only thing we used to do we used to actually stone dresses for croissant or choice that, at those days. That was uh, the one way of income. And sometimes when we used to come maybe back home here to America, or here and there we used to teach, which was also very hush-hush because in those days amateurs were not allowed to teach. Right. So it was always really just here and there, but it, we never had a steady income, which was okay. But for us, we knew that most our time and most our every effort, everything was going towards dancing. So parents helped here and there, but again, you know, living in England wasn't easy. So um, we kind of went by lessons that we used to take were with Peter Maxwell, Lorraine and Shirley Dallas. Those were the three major, that I would say for most of our career that actually kind of kept us together and, you know, gave us the most. And well, of course we had some guest lessons here and there, but these three were the most, like the, the constant teachers that we had. Okay, so I have a question. I mean, I guess maybe that's like more of my question. When you look at today's dancing, because we come from the same generation mm -hmm. of dancing, and I know there are certain things that bother me. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain thing that bothers you about today's dancers, today's competitors, today's, uh, I don't know, competitions? You know, when we started dancing, like ballroom dancing, I think it's 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 a partnership. It's a man and woman dancing together. What I feel is happening more and more these days that it, that's kind of getting lost. Like everybody, of course, is becoming faster, greater, like more flexible, more rhythmical. But 
the core of where it all started, that there's two people dancing together, I feel like that's kind of going more and more away. So if anything, I would say for me, that's, that's the part that I'm seeing less and less these days. I'm not saying, yeah, of course, everyone, like, like I said, amazing talent and ability, of course, is getting, but in the, everyone's starting to become looking the same. That's one thing, the individuality is kind of gone. And I think like the partner, you know, partnering, man and woman, it's not there anymore. You judge a lot of competitions. You judge um, some top events in the United States and internationally as well. Um, <clears throat> what do you think the dancers need today? Um, what kind of advice would you give to the dancers? Uh, and um, think about it this way. Um, amateur dancers, professional dancers, prime dancers. You know, at the end of the day, um, I feel like sometimes people go away from, like, what's the question? It's not like this question. I think he's hearing your voice. <laughs> would be at the end of the day you know we all here we do this because we love doing it I think a, a lot sometimes it's starting to become like it's not it's it they trying to kill each other yes of course they everybody wants to have a better result but at the end of the day there's still I feel like they need to have a, a good a, the good atmosphere the good um, what's the word I was looking like the good relationship with each other because when we stop we all still here we're all still friends and um kind of when we would compete we really take it so personal but when we stop we realize that actually it, yes in, at that particular time it's one of the most important maybe things that you want to get that result but there's so much more important things after that that it's it doesn't it's not worth it to actually maybe become enemies with somebody or like go so far that actually one day you're gonna look back at it and think that that was so not worth it to actually use your all your energy and all your stress for that particular thing. I think like I, I would take it. Yes, it it is important thing, but don't take it so like so far that a lot of times people take it a little bit too far. I think. So a lot of the time. We watch couples practicing and they're fighting and they're fighting constantly and they're fighting to the point where people around them are uncomfortable um what do you think about that as a person who danced uh, and obviously you know dancing with another person it's, it's not an easy it's not an easy job um miscommunication happens how do you deal with and what again what advice would you give to those couples because it seems like a lot of couples that you know um, are behaving this way when they're practicing? You know, unfortunately, I think every single one of us who's competed knows that that's how it goes, unfortunately. And the only thing that what makes the situation a little bit better, if you have the same two people who are going exactly the same way at each other, this is this is war. Like that, you're not. Gonna, it's very difficult to progress, and it's very difficult to go forward, especially because you know that it's just two of you against everybody else. So if you're already having this kind of thing between each other, how are you gonna actually go forward against the whole army that's trying to kill you? So yes, that's definitely happening. The, the only advice from my side, I can say that if you, this should be, I think in the partnership one, should be that's uh, the dominant and then there has to be one that has to back down at some point. If ever we both just go this way, it's not going. It's not going to get anywhere. And I guess with my personality and in, in our partnership, I, I was most of the time the one who would back down. But I think that's the only reason why we were able to progress. Because if I would be the same going back at it, there would be just like banging against the wall. There would be no way of moving forward. So I think that it's hard at the, when it's the heat situation, it's very hard to actually realize it and say, okay, I'm just gonna stand down. But I think it, it's very important that one has to, like, it doesn't mean that it's all it has to be the same person, but in every situation, like in, in, 
in every practice, if it gets to that point, I think one has to adjust to it, you know? You had one partner, basically your most successful partner mm -hmm. for your entire, if you think about it, yes. adult career. Yes. Um, and again, that's very rare. It's, it's very rare in our mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the time, couples don't stand together for a long time and it takes quite a few partner changes right. in order to achieve a result. What's the success, like, what, what made your partnership that successful? That you were able to not only become obviously very you know top dancers in the industry, but you were able to stand the test of time mm -hmm. in your in your partnership. You know, the, I think the most important thing is that we were very best friends off the floor. Off the floor, we could not. We just had the best time. Of course, on the floor, like you know, you, know, you said before, we all had challenges and we all dealt with them, but. Off the floor, we were just the best friends. His family is my family. My family is his family. So, and especially when I met Michael, I was 17. So of course I felt like, and we danced for 10 years together. So my whole, uh, like becoming an adult, I was with them. So it, it, I think that was very strong. Like it doesn't matter how hard it was on the floor. We knew that when we go home, when we off the floor, we, we would do anything for each other, we would kill for each other. So I think that was the reason that uh, we, we could go so for so long, but that was also the reason why we stopped because after 10 years, um, we still were very successful, and but we had different visions at that time. You know, after when you dance for 10 years together, especially for me, I from 17 to 27, of course, you change as a person, you change. You just, there's a lot of changes. So um, we just had dif different ideas what we wanted to do. And of course we could have pushed and fought through it, but we said that we want to stay friends. And if we still kept on going for another two, year or two, we were afraid that we would stay enemies, like we would stop and then we'd be so bad. Like, and that was not the, like, we did not want that. So the reason why we stopped was and so abruptly and like, it, because we both thought that we would still continue with other people and we the most important thing we wanted to stay friends and that was the reason why we stopped so I think the reason we had such a good career we know such a good friendship for so long was because of the feelings for each other I definitely we were just even to this day like even yesterday I spoke to him for two hours you know it's like sometimes you know you lose maybe contact for a while but like that was the the reason why the whole thing worked. Mm -hmm. So you um, basically retired as a professional at the age of 27, which is in today's world way too early mm -hmm. because people dance Latin probably till they're 37 easily. Mm -hmm. um, and you became famous, but in a slightly different emploi. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, well, yes, I retired pretty young. I mean, I never thought I would retire, but I stopped and I, I still thought that I would compete and I would find other partners. And I did have a, quite a few trials with a lot of very famous and good dancers, but things just did not work out for different reasons. And um, in another way, when I stopped so young, I always knew that that's a perfect age because I always wanted to have a family. And I thought, you know, this is just, working out right, I stopped so I can now concentrate because of course when you dance, private life is kind of goes out of the window because you're constantly on the road, you're going everywhere. So when that's happened, I was like, okay, I'm set. Now I can concentrate on the next chapter of my life. So I was always very clear that that's what I want. I want to have a family, I want to have children and all of that. Um, then things happened here and there. And then I met my, well, I knew my husband for many years, but we got together with you know, my, my husband, Zach, I'm sure everybody knows that, and we got married, and after getting married, you know, like every other couple, you start trying for children and all of that, and that was the case, and it did not happen so easily in the first year or two, and then, uh, you know, I was going to my doctors constantly, making sure that everything is good and all the tests were good and then in November 2014 um, after being at my doctor 
literally I think a month before, which you know, normal thing, I guess I got diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer, which was a shock because I get it if I was never going to the doctors and you know that's understandable. But when you're there a month before and then a month later they tell you stage four, that's a shock. So of course our lives changed drastically after that. Um, yeah, um, it was the decision was first one we heard because of course stage four is pretty far. Um, what do we do first? The decision was do you go uh, chemo first or surgery first? Because I was very lucky to get into one of the best hospitals, which is uh, Sloan Kettering in the, in the city, which is again not very easy to get, especially in two weeks since I was diagnosed. But thank God we have friends and in the dance world as well, people that help just connections. So we got in there. And the decision was do I do surgery, which uh, uh, Sloan Kettering is very famous for basically. What they do is called ultimate debulking surgery. So they can take most of your organs out and you can still have a normal life. That's what they're famous for. And that was going to be my surgery, uh, which we decided to do because I thought, let me just get all of it out and then I can go into chemo. Um, we go to the surgery. I wake up, of course, you know, when you go, you never know how long, but you wake up and I. I remember clearly, first thing I asked, how did it go? And everybody says to me, it went well, okay. Which I found out later that they literally just opened me up. And when they saw how bad it was, where it hurts, because a CAT scan only shows tumors to particular size. And if they're smaller than this particular size, you don't see it on a CAT scan. So when the doctors opened me, they found it was much worse was what it really was so they decided let's just close her quickly so she can heal as quick as possible so we can start chemo as quick as possible so what happened actually i remember very clearly i think when i was in the hospital a few days later actually igor and Fuki came to visit me and many people came to visit me and which was very nice of course um i really healed pretty quickly which is again very Doctors were very surprised how quick it was. I think it was literally 10 days and I started chemo within 10 days and the scar was basically all the way. So going kind of away from it, I think being a dancer prepares you for uh, like, in, if you compare regular people who haven't been what, you know, what we put our bodies through and all of the training, it definitely, and also muscle toning and, and mind, all of it definitely makes a big difference. Of course, also I was much younger than generally when people get that disease, especially in my case, I was also, the age was maybe on my side as well, but definitely I think all of it helped plus being positive because if I'm really honest with you, looking back at it now when i got when i got the news i was never so like maybe i was in denial and only now i realize what really happened to me but at that particular moment i was never like i never realized what like that i have cancer what i was upset about was because I, I, it was so far gone that i could not have children so for me that was much more of a blow I, not that i had cancer because i thought I thought, okay, I knew there's going to be treatments, there's going to be things to go through and I'll just go through it and then hopefully I'll be fine. But for me, definitely that I could never have any more children, that, that, that was for me much more of an upset. So yeah, so we did surgery and then after that when we started chemo, every time we would go for checkups, it would just go in the number, would go lower and lower and lower. And just to give you a perspective, usually with ovarian cancer, there's this Test, it's, a, it's a regular blood test which you only find out later but if you can do it anybody can have it done if you know about it it's called CA so it's cancer antigen 125 so it's a, just a regular blood test and normal numbers when you have it done if you're okay is 0 to 35 that's normal range when I was diagnosed I was an 8,000 something 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 so again Another thing, like when you know things, like now when I know things, if I knew maybe then I would have, even when you go for your regular checkups, you would ask, like now when I go, my mom goes, I say, ask for this. If you don't ask, you don't get, it. you know? So it also knowledge is very important. I think that's, even though I, like I said, I was at my doctor's, but I think if I knew more specific things, I probably maybe would not, wouldn't have been in the situation, but I guess 
that's how another thing you know what's so interesting that when i was young i always had this feeling that i probably i don't know why but i had this feeling that i won't be able to have children and i would never i never of course you would never think that in the future you will because of this but i always had this fear and i, I, I was always think what would i do like hopefully my future husband would be okay with it and what we would do would we adopt like i always had this thought in my mind and now after going through all of this i'm like ah oh, okay i guess life we, you know we like know. How, we know yeah we you know. know so yeah so that was a big change in our lives in 2014 the first year you know went through all the surgeries all the and then another thing what i found out during that uh, that i had a genetic test done again which we never know what it is even until you get into the situation and i'm actually have the gene uh, BRCA gene 2 positive which means that i have it uh, it's ovarian cancer and the breast cancer chance so again first in the family nobody but never would i just never knew what it was until that happened so now at least i know and then i'm telling all my family members like i think knowledge is very important about all those things so yeah and now i'm here i mean um i was in remission for three years uh, last summer i had a little setback again but i feel like these days as long as you are checking yourself you know frequently there's so many new things every, almost every month there's something new so as long as you can catch things on the right time and i mean i thought i caught my first time it was the right time you know a month later but i guess it was different but i had a little basically last summer i had a little back like uh, i had to go through treatments again but now i'm back to normal and just you know every four weeks checkups and things like that <laughs> I know. Sorry, it's, no, it's a little okay. Bit. It's, yeah, I think I think I think it's important because um, I say to people now, um, ladies, have to, don't wait until you're forty to get your mammograms. Really, don't wait until you're forty, even though this is what the doctors say. Go much earlier because, um, unfortunately, I feel like cancer is getting to younger and younger people. Absolutely. And that's the very unfortunate thing, but I think this is where we are. So uh, absolutely, I totally agree with you. You know, read up as much about it and just do. You know, if it's mammograms, like anything, like even like blood tests and even genetic tests, because all of that matters. At least you, you just know that if you are, you know, having a like seeing even your family history all of that is so important because when you don't know you just don't know like but when you do know you you can there's so many things that you can actually prepare or even do before even that gets to you so i think knowledge is a power for sure okay so maybe a little bit of a controversial question uh you know away uh back to the dancing um I mean, I don't know if you follow it, um, but now we have, you know, when when you used to dance, uh, as an amateur, you used to dance in uh, IDSF. Mm -hmm. Once you turn professional, you started dancing for WTC. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, for the past 10 years, um, both organizations really went mm -hmm. in their separate directions. Yes. Uh, recently, uh, some of the top dancers, including uh, Arunas Bizokas and um, you know, you know, quite a few title dancers actually came out and said, "Well, we're going to create, in a way, a third organization, um, WDO." Mm -hmm. What do you think about this thing? Especially because when you, um, when your career was at its peak, this was not going on, and now every single dancer has to deal with uh, either making a choice of being in one organization, the other organization. Judges have to either support one organization or the other. Now this third organization is you know, coming up. What are your thoughts? I feel sad about it, to be honest <laughs> with you, because I you know it's hard as it is for dancers, I mean, to try and choose and like, there's so much going, dancers should be just thinking about the dancing and getting better in what they do, not thinking about all this 
extra thing, you know. And of course, the more all of this is happening, is getting worse and worse, and then you have to choose which competitions to dance. In our days, there was just amateurs, professionals, and all the best couples were always together, and there was nothing. And now, I don't want to go too deep into it, but I just feel I feel very sad for dancers, I, and I hope one day maybe that's gonna somehow get back that it can be all together because it's really it's it's getting more and more ridiculous like yeah i agree <laughs> maybe someone has a question <laughs> that they like, would like to ask something everyone's like <laughs> uh, i think everyone is still thinking about the previous <laughs> question um so we were talking about WBO, and um, I don't know if you started to, um, to judge on some of these competitions. So, in, like, what's in your opinion, like, what what should be the criteria of judging? Because besides, like, ten years, we went from one big family, we went into uh, okay, we dancing with more like uh, pop music, WBSF or IDSF, mm -hmm. and now we're gonna keep. WBC is saying we're going to stay more with the uh, classical way of, especially with Latin mm -hmm. with the standards of the same. Um, what do you think, what should be the criteria, the main criteria of, of getting all together? I mean, if we're talking about the judging, the criteria, I think that should never change. It should be the core of dancing, you know, what you always believed in. I think it doesn't matter the music or the style, I think that should always stay as it was that should not be the different you know what's gonna like the matter of the judging i definitely if we talk about the judging from my personal opinion i think as a competitor you always feel like first of all that music is too long you want it to be shorter and that, <laughs> but if we talk it from the other side it is if you're really honest and when you really have to compare somebody when it's really like in the final, okay, you already had time to like, but sometimes in the first rounds, when you have 20 couples on the floor and the music is one minute 45, if you're really honest, there's no ways you can be objective and see every single couple. And like, that's why a lot of times you get, somebody doesn't get a mark just, just because by we human and it is possible that you can miss somebody just because it's really, first of all, not enough time to actually mark everybody and see everybody properly. I think definitely that would be one of the things as a judge. I would definitely want to have more time for sure. I think, it, and it's so stressful as it is, and especially when you, you know, already on the high level, when you have like, it, this is people's lives. You actually, like, it's not just, you know, anything. And, uh, because dancing is all about preference, like it, it's not like you know in tennis or sports. If you you gotta go, you gotta go. It's clear. Dancing, it's all opinion. It's all I like this or I like this. So and plus, okay, you can, it's fine to like that or that, but you want to have enough time to actually see it. And I feel a lot of times, especially in the first rounds, music is just so fast. And especially actually in programs, sometimes when you have four competitions at the same and especially in the first dance i think most of the time you see the difference because when the, the first dance comes on and you have four different competitions and the music is so short you're only trying to figure out who is against who and because everybody's on the same line so it, it's not like you know that these couples are together they, and then you have to find those couples so as the competition goes, goes on then they already re remember numbers so then you already know when even if the teacher comes with another student you already know the numbers so you already can understand in the beginning you like uh everything is so so stressful. it is stressful it is stressful and a lot of times people don't understand oh you didn't mark me or how can i get this result but sometimes it's just we human it's it's really an just an error like you know there's nothing you can say but sometimes you just really miss it like you just do not have t enough time or what happens i mean just open it. What happens sometimes if you know somebody and you know that you already have a 
and understanding what they usually look like you kind of know okay i'll just put you through and then whatever i have left which is probably a couple of seconds then i can try to look at everybody else which is also like it's just it's hard it's hard do you like do you like judging you don't like, I don't like judging either. You don't like judging. <laughs> you know, in the beginning, when you first start judging, you feel like it's in, it's part of the first, you know, you stop you competing, you have to do it. It's, it's, it's an honor that you're invited. And in the beginning, yes, and you're younger and you feel like you can stand on those heels and you're, you're okay. Yeah. As the years go by, um, all of that kind of disappears. And then you start thinking, first of all, you're in pain. You're freezing. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're hungry. You're hungry. You're hungry. <laughs> you're hungry. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and it's just, it's not fun anymore. And, and yeah. And it's stressful. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And you know, of course, sometimes you feel like you have to do it, but I'll be honest with you, more and more, uh, like, and especially after my, previous you know what i went through i just don't want to put myself through it because i feel like after competition i have to have two days to just like <laughs> like everything like you know even if you're standing like everything is more hurting than actually when you were dancing sometimes so it just it's it's yeah i'm not i'll be honest I'm not the biggest supporter of that anymore used to but yeah Okay, so another question. I guess I have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, you know, as you're judging now, is there anything that you would have done different as a dancer knowing what you know as a judge today? <laughs> oh, yeah. I think that's the, that's the thing with, with us dancers. I wish we started the other way around because I think we would have been so much better dancers to begin with. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we... Even like with like when you stop competing, you start more teaching, so you actually start realizing more about even the actual dancing yourself, like what you're talking about, and then every everything, yeah. absolutely. I think if it would go the other way around, I think we would be much better dancers. Yeah. yeah. If only we knew then. When we exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But what, for your dancing, what what do you think you would change you personally? You know. <sighs> When we used to compete, I, I mean, I think it's it's maybe normal for everybody, but we used to be so worried about like everything, like how they look at us, or even like sometimes if somebody doesn't mark us well, we'd think that oh he does like that person hates us, and like now being on the other side, it, this is so not true. It's not personal. It's not personal. It, it's unfortunately sometimes the, at the second that I looked at you, maybe. Like if I compare, you were not as better. But in those days, we thought that's it. That judge is always bad for us because he hates us. So, like even things like that, we used to preoccupy ourselves with. Like instead of thinking more about maybe just what we do and just get better ourselves, we used to think of all that extra thing that I think would have been so much nicer that we did not disturb ourselves with that. So, what would you focus more than just on your dancing? Absolutely, this? absolutely. Exactly. More about us. More about just improving us. Not thinking about how what everybody. We I think we used to think too much what everybody else thought of right, us. Right. Right. If they smile, that means they like us. If they don't smile, <laughs> oh, they don't like us. So that would sometimes like it's it's just all of that extra thing. It's just all about you and perfect. So that's what you would you suggest for people who still who compete? Absolutely. Just. Enjoy, absolutely here. absolutely and if you think that if somebody did not mark you like you expected next time when you walk by don't just don't be don't look so mean because we you know <laughs> we know we know what you do like we know how you feel but this is so not what it should be just because all of this goes by so fast like we all think we have all these years to keep going and this will go by so fast and then we're all gonna be on the same like don't waste your energy and just on things that you don't need to do it you know put it more into what what's important is your dancing getting better and don't waste it on all the other stuff that's why i think also this you know the politics and the federations it's, it, that's why it's so disturbing because people are people are affected by that yes mm -hmm. So now you have a company right now, and uh, 
give us a little bit more information about it. Okay, so the, how the whole thing started basically was when, before I got sick, there were quite a few companies, dress companies that approached me and they wanted to maybe design, me, for me to design a practice wear or do like a collection or something under my name. But uh, if I would do that, I would never be employee controlled. They would just use my name. So I was never very comfortable with that because I did not know what had come out. So I did not want to put my name to it. So when I got sick, of course, um, I, in the beginning, my doctors told me that I have to maybe rethink my career because maybe I won't be able to stand on the floor and teach and do all of that because that could be a possibility. So um, since I always had this idea of maybe having something to do with dresses and uh, and I had one particular company that, uh, oh, not company, group, group of people that always wanted to do something with me in that direction. So when I got sick, I kind of thought, why don't I, if I don't try it now, this is the perfect time because before I never really had time to do that and now I am not teaching, I'm not working, I'm just going through my treatment. So this is the perfect time to actually maybe also to put my mind away from all of that's what's happening. So I thought, okay, let me try, let's see. So let's kind of get together, design some things and see where it goes. So we did that and uh, we it took off. Uh, uh, our company is called Mason Dean. We've been open already since 2015, but I think not many people know about it because we have a different um, way about it. We don't have anything in stock. It's all made to measure. It's all bespoke. Uh, we meet with clients one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we have two collections a year. So basically we come with a set collection. We go through it. We have everything already sourced, fabrics. Everything is already, you know, is sourced so basically applying likes as it says I like this dress we just make this dress and what we do also we take it out of the collection so when we see the next client we never show the same dress so basically oh, wow. it's that client's dress if they want it we'll make it for them in every single color they want but we'll never make the same dress for another person basically wow. so uh, since we've already been for quite a while um, I'm sure a lot of people already changed as well with this, uh, but we never used to have labels, so that's why nobody never knew that this was our dress. The label was on the inside always, and um, we never re advertise unless client wants to put themselves, like they want to put themselves, that this is the dress made by Mason Dean. Uh, so that's why not many people know. We really do mostly private showings in studios, or already, like, we already have existing clients, so we just kind of go back to them. Uh, and just word of mouth, we we really not. There's nothing for us to show. Like we don't really vent because we would never would not have nothing to show it because it's all in the you know booklet and we just go through the collections. So um, how that all happened? Also, I, there's a story about the name Mason Dean. Um, we actually were driving to Hilton Head one summer for holiday, and we we're in the car for a very long time. Hilton Head is far away from New Jersey, and we started thinking of the names for for the company i never knew wanted to do anything to do with my name i just did not i felt like i wanted something completely different and in america there's a lot of companies that have two different like two strong names right uh so we the whole way through we're like putting things together and then for some reason we thought mason dean sounds right like it sounds good um, but we were still not 100 percent sure if that's what we want to name it so i have a couple uh, in japan that's one of our biggest followers so when i got sick they actually came to visit me and when they came here we had mason Dean written on the on the um, paper and with japanese a lot of times even like with a language when they read some even some regular names they read it differently they pronounce it differently and it doesn't sound the same so when i said can you tell me like how would you read this how would you say it and both of them said mason dean when they said that to us, that was that was it. That's <laughs> so they, thought, they thought said it exactly how it is, and then we're like, okay, this is going to be the but name of our Mason? company. Why did nothing to do, not, no no <laughs> connection, nothing in the family, like zero. But just we just we liked it how it sounds. It was two strong, you know, names. In, so yeah, nothing to do. It's a man's name, right? Yeah, yeah. That's why when uh, I actually. Uh, 
when I already after I was sick for my first birthday, um, my husband Zach he gave me this amazing um, present, and when we got him, we were like, okay, so what we're we gonna name him? Mason. Mason. That was clear. That was not even a question. So now everybody's asking, when is Dean coming? So <laughs> that's gonna be a little bit harder to have too. But yeah, so that's how Mason Dean came. So you know we. Um, we have about seven people on our staff. We also have some of our staff actually went to FAT to train and also had some, uh, some of them had criteria licenses. So we really, we're trying to, like, we're small, but we, we're not trying to take it over everything, but we, we, it's all about quality and service. You know, we very much about customer service. But practice, just practice for no, 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 competition. No so far, no, pra oh. actually, next uh, next on the project is to have practice, but so far it's men and women, it's all competition stuff. Oh, oh, yeah. oh. but do you have a practice for We're working right now. Oh, okay. It's on the way, yes. So because let's say if I would like to uh, contact you, uh, I just have to contact the right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll come. That's so. that's another thing. What we do because a lot of actually we have a lot of clients in the West Coast. So what we do part of our service when people buy a dress. So of course we take all the measurements. Uh, about in about three to four weeks, no three weeks we come to them. Doesn't matter where they are in the country. We come oh, for a fitting. Oh. So that's mandatory. We we'll come to them. And sometimes if they need another fitting, we we'll come as well. So of course it would be much easier if all the clients would be here. But actually most of our clients are far away so that's a part of our service so yeah and then also after they dance for the first time at the competition if anything is adjusted that's part of so as well we take care of that so it's not like you just send by mail like a lot of no. companies do we do like, send it once we already everything right, right, but, but meet, right? yes. not like okay no. send you. I'm like that's not my dress no 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 <laughs> everything is yes you okay. see that's that was the reason why I really wanted to do that because I heard I mean, I hear a lot of those stories, and for me, I was very lucky because to, uh, during our professional career, we had one of the best sponsors, which is Taka Dance Fashion in Japan, mm -hmm. and we were, they treated us like royalty. We were, I mean, we were, we could not ask for better. Again, it also helped because I was same size as most of Japanese women, so my dresses used to, I used to just wear it once and I used to already have people coming for asking to sell it, so it kind of worked work both right. ways, but they were so amazing. It doesn't matter where we were, they would come for fittings That's to us, so I, Saka, yeah, yeah, so we were really lucky, so I just felt like I wanted to do exactly the same to people who actually paying for the dresses. We were just getting it for free, right, right. but you know, when as everybody knows, dresses are not cheap. It's a struggle. So <laughs> I think service is the least we can do. Oh, yeah. amazing. So now if you fly there, how many people are flying? Two. Most of the time, two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You and... Mm -hmm. Sometimes even not me. Some of them. But well, a lot of times why I would fly because, especially if it's in the studio, I would fly because I would teach at the same time. Oh, so it kind of works both ways. I would teach, somebody else would do fittings, and we kind of just work it around. And mm -hmm. do you design all these clothes? Are you in charge of design? I mean, I have designers that really work 24 7 it. I work with them. You direct but them? them I, I have ideas? a very good designing team. And uh, do you sew yourself? <laughs> you uh, I do the small things, but not like, like a buttons. Yeah, <laughs> I do the little, yeah, those things, yeah, but no, I don't actually so, no. But, mm -hmm. but when you started that. this company, were, uh, were you designing everything? Or? You see, with, with my own stuff, it was, Michael used to be amazing with that, so uh -huh. he used to have a very good eye for that, and I would be just, <laughs> I, w I was never, most of the time, I would never say no to anything. I would try anything. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. we had a good combination. Like, you know, he would kind of initiate things and I would be sure. And maybe I just want a little bit like that. Uh, when I stopped, of course, now we work together with the designing team. But uh, with my own stuff, Michael was actually most of the time in charge. Yeah. So it, was, it wasn't even your ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're easy going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, just a random question. What do you like to do that is outside of your business and outside of the dance world? What's your favorite hobby? 
I, you know, I, for me, it's like my medicine. I like to work out, especially since I stopped dancing. Because when we dance, we, without just doing anything else, you're physically fit. You just that's a normal thing. When you stop dancing, you still want to do the same things, and you realize, oh, oh. So in the beginning, you always feel like, okay, I have to start adjusting. So for me, like I, uh, especially now, I feel like if I don't go to work out, I, I'm not the same. Like it's like my drug, it's, you know. I need it. So I would say this thing for me is almost. I have six days a week. I go for sure. So I, I it, and it's not like for some people it's like burden. Like they push themselves. For me, I, I, I feel the opposite. If I don't go, I feel really bad. So I feel like one hour a day for a dancer, this is nothing, you know. So I would say this, I really, really enjoy. Okay, kind of workout do you do? Uh, good question. Before, I used to go to gym by myself and just do, you know, do whatever is all the machines. But about, I would say, is it already eight years ago? I started taking this class. Uh, it's. Um, it's not a CrossFit. It's it's a mix. It's every day something different. It's like a boot camp. It's sometimes you use weights. Sometimes you run. Like it's every day is a different thing. And after I did that, I just can't do it by myself anymore. Like even when you go sometimes to competitions, you try to go to gym and you like you push, but I would not be able to do it by myself anymore. Are you taking classes. I take classes. I just I feel like. I will push myself to the maximum, but it's just so nice to just follow, not to think right. how many seconds, what minute, just tell me what to do, I'll do it, I'll kill myself, but I just don't want to think myself. I know, I'm down no, no, to spoil. No, it's easy all this and collective, you know, mm -hmm. energy, and it's also the teacher who tells you, Correct. it's easy to be a doer than pushing yourself. Exactly, yeah. exactly, so I just, oh, well. it's been almost, yeah, it's eight or even nine years, and. I would definitely say thank you to to this class because even through my since I've been retired, like we did here and there some shows. Even with Michael, we had this very interesting show in Mexico, which like Dancing with the Stars. And I remember when I went there, we've been off the floor for many years. I was so I mean, of course, you dancing wise, you feel like you're not the same, but just fit, fitness wise. I was fine, and again, it's just because of that class. Because if I did not do anything, I would just do two steps and I'd be dying, mm -hmm. you know. So definitely, I think that's important. What about your favorite movie? What's your favorite? Uh, favorite <laughs> it's movie? One. It's a tough one. Um, okay, so if, if I go through my life, like that, what affected me? If I'm really honest, when Dirty Dancing came out which I was, I don't know how young I was, I was, I must have watched it a hundred times. I think that definitely affected me. Also, even though maybe it was not very well reviewed when Bodyguard came out, also I, I remember very clearly I watched it in Norway. We were actually having, I was still with my partner from Lithuania, we were actually having lessons in Norway with standard lessons. And we went to see a movie which was bodyguard and it affected me crazy and i think one of the last movies i saw which was on the plane which i was by myself and i cried like a baby um, bohemian rhapsody it's that that movie i can yeah after the story and but were you a fan of that movie before? Always, yes, of course, like of course. Them. I think everybody from Europe, right, right, right. We, we, yeah, yeah, we grew up with that. To follow that thing because I just saw that. And that's rock. Yeah. Is it good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I must say also, I saw just recently um, Star is Born, and a lot of people say yeah. that they love it or hate it. Also, I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved it, yeah. Any more questions? <laughs> well, I guess as the last thing, any advice you can give to dancers today? Or kind of like a wisdom. <sighs> you know, it's. It, I think it's not even so much about dancers and just in life. I think we have to, usually like before 
I used to always think about the future one day or you you know you want to think you save for that one day or I will get I'll do this one day I think you have to live today because you never know what tomorrow will be and after what I went through I mean of course within the reasons I'm not saying you have to just do everything and you know but I think you have to enjoy life more because we always work 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 and we all think just that one day I will do that what if that one day never comes I think if you have your family around you just in, enjoy every moment because you never know so I think it's it's more the life thing not you know not just dancing I think we all need to appreciate more each other and just live for today more because things happen especially these days just in every situation there's so much happening around that we don't know what's going to be tomorrow and i think it's important to don't forget that especially like i said you have all your close ones still here cherish them you know sometimes we all want to just kind of fight with it or just don't don't do that appreciate them enjoy every single moment because we don't know Life is precious, you know, and I think I'm sure you, you know, all, all of us have somebody or know somebody. It's it's important to do that because we don't know we don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. And so far, we all here, we healthy, so we need to appreciate that and just enjoy it. Thank you so much for coming. Absolutely, thank it you for having me. It was absolute pleasure because I was one of those people watching you. I'm learning from your tapes, and a lot me? Oh God! <laughs> I knew all your routines, all your music, everything went to the all the costumes. <laughs> Thank but you. Yes, it's true. It's true. I really yeah. have this morning before I went to work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And um, you know, for people that are going to be watching this uh, online, um, you know, um, Vieta has a favorite charity that um, whoever likes this talk. And they're willing to, you know, spend, um, you know, a couple of dollars for a charity. The charity that she would want to, you know, for you to donate is the Varian Cancer Research Alliance, which is Okra. And we're going to post the link of it when we post the video. And, um, you know, it would be great that, you know, as, you know, it's kind of a way of thanking her for, you know, a very... Uh, busy schedule to come here to come down here and you know to speak to us and uh, to speak to all the dancers who are going to be watching this this would be a wonderful charity to donate uh, something to thank you thank you, thank you.